The story you're about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts about historical characters, events, or locations. Please sit back and listen as I narrate this story to you. A chilling scream cut through a peaceful neighborhood in the village of Westbury around 3 p.m. on July 4, 1956. Mrs. Beatrice Weinberger, 34 years old, had just entered her home for a brief moment while her baby slept. The carriage was empty when she returned. Peter Weinberger, her 31-day-old son, had vanished from his baby carriage. He was far from the first American child to be kidnapped for ransom. He was not from a well-to-do family. He came from a middle-class family in suburbia. His father, Morris, was a humble pharmacist. The amount demanded for Peter's safe return was $2,000 and is today roughly equivalent to $20,000. Certainly not a high amount for a middle-class family like the Weinbergers, but nowhere near the exorbitant sum demanded for Lindbergh Jr. In 1932, the world was shocked by the nighttime kidnapping of 20-month-old Charles Lindbergh Jr., from the second floor of his parents' home in East Amwell, New Jersey. A ransom note demanding $50,000 for the return of the famous aviator's son was discovered. Despite a massive manhunt, international attention, and meeting the kidnappers' demands, the remains of Charles Lindbergh Jr. were discovered some two months later. The Weinbergers lived in a suburbia where people were not afraid of being targeted by extortionists. The kidnapping of Weinberger instilled fear in the hearts of ordinary Americans. People began to lock their doors. Almost overnight, an entire country's sense of security vanished. When Mrs. Weinberger came back to check on her son, all she found was an empty carriage and a ransom note. The note read, Attention, I'm sorry this had to happen, but I am in bad need of money and couldn't get it any other way. Don't tell anyone or go to the police about this because I am watching you closely. I am scared stiff and will kill the baby at your first wrong move. Just put $2,000 in small bills in a brown envelope and place it next to the signpost at the corner of Abar Merle Road and Park Avenue at exactly 10 o'clock tomorrow, Thursday morning. If everything goes smooth, I will bring the baby back and leave him in the same corner, safe and happy, at exactly 12 noon. No excuses, I can't wait. The note was ominously signed, your babysitter. The Weinbergers ignored the kidnapper's warning and contacted law enforcement. Police asked the press to refrain from covering Peter's kidnapping for one day until the ransom was paid, fearing that front-page headlines would scare off the perpetrator, or worse, drive him to harm Peter. Except for the New York Daily News, which ran the story of Peter's kidnapping in its evening edition, the newspapers cooperated. By the next morning, Peter's kidnapping had made the front pages of every New York newspaper. The shock of such a crime against such ordinary people quickly spread across the country. After all, if it could happen to the Weinbergers, it could happen to anyone. If it could happen in the suburbs, in the middle of the afternoon, it could happen anywhere to anyone. The Weinbergers left the money in an envelope where they were instructed to at the end of the street the following morning. But by then, the house was crawling with cops and whoever had kidnapped Peter never showed up at the drop. During the press conference, a tearful Beatrice Weinberger went on TV and radio to make an anguished plea for the return of her baby, who needs the care of his mother, before breaking down in subs and being unable to continue. The heartbreaking scene had no effect on the baby snatcher. It took six long, agonizing days for his parents to hear from him again. He told Morris to take a specific exit off Northern State Parkway, a major thoroughfare serving Westbury and the rest of Nassau County, and leave the ransom there. When no one showed up to collect the money, the kidnapper called the Weinbergers again, this time changing the drop point to another exit down the parkway. A blue duffel bag was waiting at the exit, along with a second handwritten note with instructions on where to find Peter. The note, however, only provided false hope. Peter was not present. Police kept an eye on the exit in the hopes of apprehending the kidnapper as he collected the money, but no one arrived. The discovery of the second note coincided with the end of the seven-day waiting period mandated by the Federal Kidnapping Act, and the FBI took over the case from the Nassau County Police. When the FBI was called in, the hunt for little Peter became more intense but also appeared to be stalled. Even as the trail grew cold and days turned into weeks with no new breaks, 
and no new word from the kidnapper, the Weinbergers never gave up hope that their child was alive and safe. What the public didn't realize was that federal agents were laboriously working on the only leads they had, the handwritten note and the voice on the taped phone calls. The ransom note had revealed a telltale quirk in the kidnapper's handwriting. Following the examination and elimination of nearly 2 million samples from military records, tax returns, voter registration forms, and DMV applications in the New York area by a dedicated force of 150 federal agents and NASA cops who had been working around the clock looking for a signature with the same distinctive characteristics, the search was called off on August 22, 1956. An agent at the United States Probation Office in Brooklyn noticed a similarity between the ransom notes and writing in Angelo John LaMarca's probation file. They hit pay dirt when a weary agent combed through a file of people whose probations were about to be discharged and found a signature that matched the handwriting. The Treasury Department had arrested LaMarca for bootlegging. LaMarca, a married father of two young children, worked as a taxi dispatcher and truck driver. He also had a beat-up green Plymouth. A green car was parked near one of the pricey homes on Abermerley Road, a lovely three-lined street on the village of Westbury, on the afternoon of Little Peter's kidnapping. Agents immediately hauled him in for questioning, despite the fact that there was only a slim chance Peter was still alive. Lamarca, on the other hand, proved to be a difficult nut to crack. After the feds played back the tape of his voice talking to the Weinbergers, he finally cracked after more than 24 hours under the lights. It was a senseless crime committed by a naive man in desperation. Lamarca confessed to murdering a baby for the sake of his own children using twisted logic. He informed authorities that he was in serious financial trouble. He had recently purchased a 15,000 house he couldn't afford. Brooklyn loan sharks were after him for previous loans and he was terrified that his wife and children would soon be out on the street. Lamarca was arrested at his home on August 23, 1956 by FBI agents and Nassau County Police. Lamarca stated that on July 4, he was driving around aimlessly when he noticed Mrs. Weinberger pushing a baby carriage in front of her house and the distressed father came up with a brilliant idea to make a quick buck. Mrs. Weinberger was leaving her son in the baby carriage as she walked into her house. Lamarca scribbled a ransom note in his truck on the spur of the moment and snatched Peter and drove away. He told investigators that he went to the first drop site the day after the kidnapping with a baby in the car but was scared off by the amount of press and police in the area. He drove away leaving the baby alive in a tangle of honeysuckle vines near Exit 37 on the northern state, not far from his house under a darkening sky. On August 24, a swarm of cops and federal agents searched the area and discovered Peter Weinberger's decomposed remains. An autopsy revealed that the baby suffocated to death after being placed face down in the earth. Lamarca did not violate the federal kidnapping statute because he did not cross state lines, so he was turned over to the Nassau County authorities for state prosecution. He used an insanity defense at his trial that winter in late 1956, but a jury of 12 angry fathers quickly found him guilty. On August 7, 1958, he was electrocuted at Sing Sing. Despite the tragic outcome, the Daily News hailed the capture and conviction of the monster who stole and murdered Peter Weinberger as a masterpiece in detection and a textbook example of solid, relentless police work. Arguments were also made that the baby's death was not in vain. His kidnapping prompted a change in the law that allowed the FBI to take over a kidnapping case after 24 hours rather than a week, likely saving countless lives over the years and apprehending perpetrators who would otherwise have escaped justice. But it was a little comfort to the parents who had lost a child or to another young family that had been shattered by the loss of a husband and a father. Hey everyone! I just wanted to express how grateful I am that you took time out of your day to listen to my narration. This is Nikki of Twisted Mind, and I'd like to wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Salamat.